Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meanahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at the infamous Lap Dance from Artipia Games. In this game, each player takes control of a candidate to become manager of a strip club. I don't know exactly how that works. I guess the owner put out an ad on Craigslist and multiple people showed up, so he said, oh, interesting, let's play a game. <laughs> but in any case, that's what you're trying to do. So in order to do that, you need to try to fulfill the wants, desires, and orders of some pretty prestigious customers, also by utilizing the help of the uh, the of the staff there at the strip club. There's a lot of feels surrounding this game, so let's go ahead and take a look at how it actually plays before we get back to that, and then I'll give you my final opinion. All right, so the goal of lap dance is to have the most money by the end of the game. These are little money chips. The end of the game is going to happen after five rounds. You have a, uh, a customer that corresponds to every round. You're trying to fulfill their orders and fulfill their desires. At the end of, uh, after going through all five of those customers, the game ends. Whoever has the most money is going to be the winner. So each player is going to start with $3. You're going to start with two of these favor tokens, which are the little hearts. But you can never have more than three of those during the course of the game. And each player is going to get Sandra, the junior assistant, in front of them. Uh, Sandra, the junior assistant, now think about her, she, uh, the, most of this game is Yahtzee style dice rolling. And when you roll the dice, there's a chance they'll come up as stars, which I guess represent the authorities or something. But the stars are bad because they, the dice become locked. You can no longer re-roll them, uh, and it, it limits your options. But fortunately, Sandra lets you uh, get some stuff if you roll too many stars. So for instance, if you, draw, if you roll two stars, you get to draw a card. If you roll four, you get to draw two cards and a heart. And if you roll all five, you just, uh, if you roll five stars, you just get to re-roll all of those stars. So she'll give you some sort of benefits, just as sort of a, a compensation. You're also, uh, each player is going to start off with a set of six basic action cards and then four more from the main action deck. And let me go ahead and show you what those cards look like and give you a breakdown. Um, a lot of the cards are male and female strip club dancers. Up Now, here's an important distinction in this game that a lot of people get confused by at first. Up in the top corner, these correspond to the desires of the customers, and they're sort of like prerequisites. If uh, certain customers are just going to have certain desires that they uh, have, and you cannot play cards that don't match one of those symbols. But down in the opposite corner are the actual usages of the, or what you actually get from the card. So in this case, you get an extra die, but sometimes there are other symbols, like these female symbols, but these are not... Uh, analogous to the desire symbols up there. Instead, anytime you see one of those symbols down in the corner of the die, they correspond to the faces of the dice. Or I mean, down in the corner of the card, they correspond to the faces of the dice. It's kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around, but it's not too bad. Uh, so this is the Oktoberfest girl. That's her prerequisite that you need to play her, and she'll give you an extra die when you play her during the action phase. Um, here's Fairy Tale Girl. Navy Girl gives you two dice. I Obviously, I'm partial to the women in the game, so I'm showing you mostly the female cards, but I'll show you a few of the male cards too. Here's the Geisha, the Mermaid. Um, these all actually were giving you dice. I don't know, I didn't really plan it that way. Uh, here's one of the male dancer cards. They're, by the way, they're usually used interchangeably. All you're looking for is what the desires are and what they're going to provide for the customers and how they can fulfill their orders. So uh, this, she, he actually gives you a symbol rather than a die. So this is a guaranteed female dancer symbol. Uh, when you need it from the dice. The fireman is going to give you two. The jungle boy gives you both a die and a symbol. Then you have other types of cards like gift cards. Again, you're just looking at the symbol and seeing if that matches up to the desire cards. That one gives you a cigar and a die and so on. There's a little butler symbol. Drinks. They all kind of function the same within the context of the game. Now, the things that do function differently are the event cards. There's going to be a separate phase where you can play event cards, and they all have some kind of wacky effect. Bend the rules is probably the most drastic, by the way. Probably not the best one to show you first, but this lets you add more cards to your stack, ignoring the card limit, and you get a die. That's important because you can usually only play four cards. This lets you play as many cards as you want, which is pretty broken, and I should, probably should have talked about that in my overview, uh, or the final thoughts. <laughs> the temptation card, you get a favor token, and you get a die. And favor for a favor, you get a favor from another player and give that player a card from your hand and get a die. That's just a few samples of the cards, and that's an example of a card that actually targets other players. There's a few of those, and there are a few ways to prevent those kind of cards from targeting you. 
Now, these big cards here are the staff members of the strip club. And I have to say here that I have the Kickstarter edition of the game, which came with a few extra of these cards, as well as a few extra of the, like the action cards and customer cards as well. But this is the most noticeable because I believe normally you'd only have six of these cards out here. So you have an extra three. And how this works, there's these little slots here where you will actually place favor tokens when you need to use them during the action phase. And depending on how many players there are, they'll have, you'll have a certain amount of open slots. And when they're used up during a round, they're used up. They don't reset until the end of the round. Uh, Jerry, the floor manager, is probably the most drastically different from the others because when you use him with one of your favorite tokens, you get to draw one of the special cards. And the special cards are kind of like you hold on to them. You don't use them like the action cards. And they'll just give you a bonus whenever it is applicable, like the generous tip card. Before you roll the dice, choose an order. If you fulfill it, you get double the amount of money and you get a die. Or the dance for me please card. At the end of the action phase, that symbol means you get to uh, take a card that you just spent and get it back into your hand for the next round. And this one lets you do that to either uh, a male or female dancer from any player's stack. And those are just a couple of examples. As we go through the other uh, different special abilities, let's see if I can zoom in a bit here, because I do like the art in this game, and I might as well show it off. So this is the only one of the uh, bar staff that actually requires that you spend money in order to use them, which is victory points, remember, and he lets you draw two action cards. I'm not really sure that guy's that useful. Vladimir the Bouncer, actually, you can play his ability out of turn, and he lets you cancel an event card that's targeting you, although the player gets compensation in return. Alfonso lets you re-roll one locked or kept die. I'll get back to what that means in a moment, the kept part. Sony the DJ lets you roll an additional die. Uh, then we get to the ones that just give you symbols. So if you use Monica, she gives you a uh, female dancer symbol, the same as the dice for use in fulfilling orders. Same thing for Nicola, the, which is actually my cousin's name. She's a girl. That's very weird. I just noticed that now. Nicola, the bartender, is a, uh, has, gives you the wine symbol. Emily, the shot girl, you get to choose a die and double its results. Locked die may not be chosen. Again, that'll become clear in a minute. And then Dominique, the mate, the mater, the mater, the matra, shouldn't it be matra d? Whatever. Uh, he gives you the cigar symbol, which is like the luxury symbol. All right, up above there are the order cards. These determine turn order, and I'm going to get back to those in a minute. And then you have the customers, and this is what the game is primarily all about. You are trying to fulfill the uh, wants and desires of these customers. You have the bride, General Kozak, Shy Kelly, the groom, the geek, uh, who is holding a copy of New Dawn, I believe, which is a great game. <laughs> so these are just some of the customers. There's many more that you can randomly choose from. And uh, up above them are their desire cards. So when it's their turn of the round, you're going to flip over their desire card. And also, by the way, flip over the hourglass at the same time. Minute glass, I should say. And on that desire card, over to the left of the card, like I said, those are the symbols that tell you, they're like prerequisite symbols. You can only use cards with those symbols up in the top left corner to fulfill her, her orders. The other symbols, the symbols over here, are the dice symbols that you're trying to get, which may also be in the lower right-hand corner of the cards, the action cards that you play. And if you fulfill those orders, these are rewards you get, usually money. This little card symbol with a plus sign is the drawing cards, and those are favor tokens. You may also see that swirly card symbol that lets you stow a card that you just spent for the next turn. Now, each of the customers has a special ability that will actually influence the rounds. Uh, actually, there's two of them. The one that's in the light brown box is the main game mechanism ability that's going to affect the round. Underneath that is optional. The gray box is always some funny thing that you and the players can decide to do or not do at the start of the game. If you do, it's kind of like a weird prerequisite. So for the geek, it's whenever you roll the dice, the other players must clap their hands and show their support. I don't know why that's applicable for the geek. Um, uh, I guess it must be a D&D &D thing. Uh, but the main ability for the geek is at the end of the round, the player who rolled the fewest dice draws an additional card. Then if you look at the groom, it's reveal an additional desire card. Use both. You may add up the cards. Uh, you may add up to six cards to your stack. So you just get like a ton of extra cards. And his extra ability is during your turn, speak as if you were drunk. And let's just skip ahead. I'll just show you one more. Since I showed you the groom, I'll show you the bride. During the uh, rounds, event cards cost an extra favor token in order to be played. And whenever you fulfill an order, do it. Uh, do a dancing maneuver. I don't know what a dancing maneuver is, but it sounds kind of dangerous. 
Oh, and by the way, I'll say, even though I flipped over the Geeks card first, you would actually start from left to right. So the Bride, in this fictitious round, would be the first one to get flipped over. But as soon as you flip that card over, you have to flip the timer and start the round. Well, let's not beat around the bush anymore. No pun intended. Please, no pun intended. Here's how these rounds are actually going to work. Uh, at the beginning of the game, everyone's going to have their hand of cards, and you're going to flip over, like I said, you're going to flip over the desire card right away, flip over the timer, and now everybody has a minute to look through their hand of cards and put up to four cards in a stack. Now, when I say four cards in a stack, you're literally going you're literally to take all the cards that you have and only take up to four of them and put them off to the side. The rest of your cards you're going to ignore until the next round, although you may draw cards and add to it during this round. Remember that the cards you play must match the symbols that are the prerequisite symbols for the desire card of the customer. You can play event cards, but those are going to be resolved uh, first as well. Uh, and you can only play up to four cards unless you have one of those bend the rules cards. Now, as soon as you think you have your stack set and you're done, you go ahead and grab, remember the timer's still going, you grab the, the lowest numbered order card that you can. So this is how turn order is going to be determined by sort of a dexterity speed element where you're going to try to set your stack as quickly as possible and then grab the turn order cards. Uh, by the way, this game goes up to five players. I don't recommend that. Once everyone has taken a turn order card and the timer has run out, then everyone is going to flip over the stack of cards that they set, for better or for worse, make sure everything is legal. And then whoever is the first player is first going to resolve any event cards, and you'll go in turn order if anyone has any event cards. If they do or if they don't, then when you finish that, you're going to go back into the, the first player, whoever's at the first player card, and then it's dice rolling. You're going to see how many dice you have. You always have at least two dice, but then you'll add up whatever dice your cards are giving to you. I just chose these at random, so I don't even know. Okay, that's another three. So I have a total of five dice that I'm going to roll, and I'll roll the dice and try to get as many symbols as I can. Now, on the die, you have the wine glass symbol. You have the dancer symbol, you have the cigar symbol, then you have a times two dancer, uh, the locked star, and a times two either cigar or wine glass you choose when you roll the die. Now any star dice that come up as stars, you have to lock, but then you can either stop rolling the dice or continue to roll. Every time you choose to roll again, you must lock, uh, you must lock in or uh, save one of the dice. You cannot choose the lock star dice as that. It has to be something else besides that. Then you can re-roll the rest of them. If you still want to re-roll again, you have to set up, uh, save another die, not counting stars, and roll again. And you can keep doing that until you can't roll anymore. When you think you're done, when you think you've mathed it out enough, you're going to look at add up all the different symbols that you have. Remember to take your compensation from Sandra for rolling stars. Add up all your symbols to the symbols that you have on the bottom of your card. And then look to at the desire card and see which of the orders you can actually fulfill. You can fulfill more than one order at a time if you have the symbols for it, but you can't fulfill the same order twice. So you can keep stacking up rewards as long as you have enough symbols, remembering to take into account the special ability of the customer. Once you've been able to do that, you'll take whatever your compensation is and then uh, give the dice back to the center of the table and then it goes to the next player in card turn order. And once everyone has done that, that's it. You're going to reset. You're going to get rid of the customer and the desire card that you just took care of. Then uh, wipe away any of the favor tokens that you've used. And again, yes, you could be using all the favor tokens during, uh, in addition to your cards and your dice to set up the orders as well. But at the end of the round, you'll wipe those away to reset. And then it goes again. You go to the next customer, flip over the desire card, flip over the timer, and do it all over again. And you're going to do this five times. In t and at the end of five rounds, you're going to see who has the most money. That player is the new manager of the strip club. Now, let's get to my final thoughts. All right, so I guess we'll address the 800 pound topless gorilla in the room first, which is the theme of the game. When this game was first posted on Board Game Geek, actually the only information there was was the cover of the game and then a very brief description. This just caused a firestorm of controversy by Board Game Geek standards, which is like barely a blip on the radar in the internet world to the rest of the world. But in the hobby world, it was everywhere for a minute with people decrying it and saying that it was uh, legitimizing the objectification of women and the usage of women as just objects, meat for men to uh, leer at. And then other people saying, you know, this is the PC police, take your SJW crap and go elsewhere. And, you know, this, there's nothing offensive about this. It's just 
a strip club. They exist. They're real. This is a lighthearted take on it. What's the big deal? I think that as with most things, the truth is somewhere in the middle. I consider myself to be something of a feminist, and I, I believe that women should not be objectified. They should not be treated as pieces of meat. And I personally have never been to a strip club, and I have no desire to go to one. I don't think that they're wrong. I don't think that they should be banned. I think that if you want to go and have fun, then be my guest. And I know a lot of women who go to men's, you know, uh, strip clubs that are meant to be for men and just have fun there. So, okay, that's fine. It's just not for me personally. As far as the gameplay goes, or as far as lap dance the game goes and, you know, how the theme is integrated, well, first off, the theme is not integrated very well. I don't think this is the most thematic game in the world. You're not going to feel like you're running a strip club or that you're manipulating the patrons and staff of a strip club. But you know, it's there. It's there in the artwork. It's the idea of it, the, the, what the theme is supposed to be, what you're trying to do. And is that a bad thing? Well, the only bad thing that I see about it, I, I think it's a very lighthearted take on the, the genre. I don't think that it's legitimizing anything. I don't think that this is going to move the dial any, you know, one way or the other as far as saying that strip clubs are a great thing or a terrible thing. This is not what this game is supposed to be. This is just a parody of strip clubs in a way. And in that sense, I think it's harmless. But I would say that the if you want to say there's a bad thing about it, it's that it is so lighthearted and colorful and cheerful. This is not showing any of the seedy underbelly of strip clubs. Maybe that should be done in a different game to show a more realistic view of what they're like. Because while I do think that most people go into a strip club and get, you know, good service and they have a great time, there's some very upscale strip clubs I know down here in Florida, that's not the whole truth. You're seeing the presentation, the, the you know, the cover of what... Uh, is probably a very a dark industry in a lot of different ways, and that should be addressed. Should it be addressed here in a game? Probably not. This is probably not the, the, the venue for that. This is just supposed to be a fun thing, a beer and pretzels game, but we'll get back to that in a second, <laughs> that people should just try to take in a lighthearted way, not too seriously. So what am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say is it's not something to get that upset over, but at the same time, if you're someone that's getting mad at the people that are uh, you think are too PC about it, try to see it from their perspective. Because a lot of people that are upset about it are women who have been objectified throughout history. And no matter how many men who are scantily clad they put into this game, which is the case, that's it's, it's not the same. Okay, The type of objecti objectification that women have had to endure is different. And until you've walked a mile in their shoes, because most of the people who are shouting down these politically correct people, quote unquote, are men, before you've walked a mile in their shoes, I think you should understand and empathize that they might have a legitimate gripe with the theme of this game. For me, it's not a problem. For those people, it might be. So I think I'm just trying to sort of tread that line between, uh, because I think there's good points on both sides, I guess is my point. But let's move on to the actual gameplay. And like I said, the theme is not too strong in this game, which could be a knock against it. Actually, let's talk about the components first, because the components are another knock against this game. They have really low card quality, like the edges of the cards are already kind of whitening. It's just a very crappy stock. And there's even ink smudges on some of the cards that I have. Also, even though it's kind of irrelevant because all inserts, most inserts are terrible and you shouldn't bother with them anyways, my insert was destroyed. Like it was ripped apart when I opened up my brand new copy of the game and I heard that this was a semi-common thing. A lot of people had this happen, so I don't know what that's about. Um, as far as like the artwork though, I love the artwork. Again, this is gonna come back to the theme and whether you like that kind of stuff or not, but I just think that it's very well done. I mean, it's, you know, regardless of what it's depicting, it's good artwork and the graphic design is good too. Everything was very clear. The dice are nice. I didn't mean to rhyme. Uh, and uh, So that's okay. It's just that like, the actual card quality is kind of terrible. So moving on to the gameplay quickly. So the first phase of the game is interesting. This is what I compare this to both Steam Park and Galaxy Trucker, uh, where you are rushing to get something done, setting something up, and then grabbing an order card as fast as you can to get the benefit of going earlier in the round. And in this game, you're setting up a stack of cards up to four cards. And that's very interesting because even though it seems like you would run out of cards very quickly in this game, you can actually have a lot of cards in your hand 
your, your like general stack of cards throughout the course of the game, and whittling that down to the four cards that you want to play on your turn can be tough because you're flipping over that desire card at the same time you're flipping over the timer, so you have to quickly look at what's, uh, what, first, two different things. What the customer has as far as desires, which tells you which cards you are eligible to play, then you're looking down in the other corner of the cards to see and matching those up with the rest of the orders on that card to see what you know symbols you're going to need to actually fulfill the orders if those cards are even eligible. That is a very confusing thing in the game. And while it is done fairly clearly, I'm not sure how... Well, I think there should have been completely different symbols. Some of the symbols look very different. So for instance, there's a male dancer and female dancer symbol for the eligibility portion of the card. And then one of the symbols on the dice is a female dancer. I think things should have been done differently so that people aren't constantly confusing, you know, the symbols that you need just to play a card and the symbols that are on the dice that let you fulfill the orders. That can be a confusing thing. But I still think it's an interesting part of the game. It's like hand management in its purest form. Like, what do I play? What do I play? Gah! And put it down as quickly as you can, hoping that you've just made some legal plays there. Then you have things like the event cards and those can be very interesting and another reason why you want to grab the turn order cards as quickly as possible. So for the most part, I'm okay with the first phase of the game. The big problem with this game comes in the main action phase for a couple of different reasons. Well, it's one main reason with a couple of sort of splinter things going off of that, and that is that it drags on for far too long. In general, the game is too long. For this type of game, for what you're doing, for how light it feels, just dice chucking with a Yahtzee style mechanic, it just goes, I mean, it could be an hour and a half, up to two hours. I would never ever play this with four or five players again <laughs> for that reason. And it wouldn't be so bad if you felt like you're actively engaged the whole time. But while one player is trying to uh, look at all their symbols on their card, then match them up to the symbols they roll on the dice, deciding how many dice they're going to roll, deciding how many times they're going to re-roll, deciding what favors they're going to, tokens they're going to use on which uh, staff um, at the strip club, while all of that is going on, the other players are doing nothing, and it can take a long time. While I can definitely say that if you're an AP-prone person, you're going to have a really hard time with this game, even if you're not AP-prone, you kind of just have to sit there and do the math if you want to do well in the game, because that's what it's all about. It's like, okay, here's all my symbols. I need to make this work and fulfill as many orders as possible. And while in theory that's very interesting, it also just bogs the game down tremendously. Like, okay, I got this symbol, this symbol, this symbol, and then um, let's see, I can re-roll, I can get more dice if I want to, that's, that's a good idea, but oh, but what if I just use my favorite tokens here and just get more of these? And oh, this one's gonna let me double these dice as well. That's a better idea. How can I make this work? It's an easy trap to fall into and it makes the game much worse for all the players who aren't doing that on that turn. And I think what really exacerbates this is the staff cards. Now in the base retail edition of the game there are six staff cards that you have the option of using. With the Kickstarter extras it's like three or four extra ones, but even if you're down to six, it's too many. You have too many options. There's There needs to be more restriction because now it's like, look at this smorgasbord of things I can do. If you think about it long enough, and as long as you're not totally screwed by the dice, you can make it work, which makes the turns very anticlimactic. The only people that are really going to do poorly in this game are people that are totally screwed by the dice, which is pretty hard to do, actually. And even if you are screwed by the dice, it's still setting you up for next turn. My point being that th it just needs less stuff. I, I usually don't say that. It's nor normally more options, more variety is good. But in this game, because there's just a smorgasbord of things to do, it never feels like you're going to screw up too bad unless you're just randomly screwed up. And with all those options, it just bogs the game down again. So that is very, very problematic. Um, other than that, I mean, I enjoy the dice rolling. I love the fact that you can, um, uh, the way the dice rolling here works isn't just you get three re-rolls or three rolls total. It's you can keep rolling as much as you want so long as you're locking a die each time. And it's very easy through your cards to get all of the dice, <laughs> which makes that a pretty cool feeling. But there's just something about that whole phase that it's just too long, too clunky, too drawn out. It should almost even be timed. That would be another great idea. Why not? It feels weird that one section is timed, but then it's just like, okay, excitement's over. Let's think about this. <laughs> so uh, what I'm saying here is that the game is just okay just okay. 
there's some very interesting bits to it, but it really needed to be, I think, run through its paces a bit more to make sure that the fun factor was there, because at a certain point it just feels like tedium, which for the theme, which is supposed to be fun and exciting, for some people, it just didn't, that just didn't come out because of those game mechanisms. However, I will say that I'm probably keeping the game because gameplay-wise, it's like nothing that I have, and thematically, it's like nothing that I have. It's certainly a conversation piece, even though I understand why some people are offended by it. So, this will only be, I think, for people who are interested in the theme in one way or another, or people who just want a unique sort of thing to try, for people who really want a strategic effort, something really, you know, finely owned and crafted and efficient, this is just definitely not going to be for you. That's the sad truth of it. That is Laugh Dance from Artipia Games. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.